morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Misery Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Friday, June 28th, we are studying Esther chapter 6, verse 14 through chapter 7, verse 10. In today's text, Ahasuerus and Haman attend Queen Esther's second feast, in which she presents her request to the king. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Jason Schockman. Pastor Schockman serves at St. Paul's Lutheran Church School and Early Childhood Center in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. Pastor Schockman, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Glad to be back, Pastor Apple. As we get started today, give us some context. What should we know about Esther and what's been going on leading up to this section? Wow, that's not a little question, is it? It's not. Uh, it's not. So Esther, marked in the Old Testament here as a Jew, that is of the tribe of Judah, uh, one of those two tribes that has been taken captivity into Babylon, is, along with her uncle Mordecai, part of a group of people, the Jews, that have been hated by a man named Haman. Haman has planned to have all of them killed, not just sold into slavery, not just deported to some other land, not just a financial boon for the king by getting rid of all of these people, but he intends to have them all killed, which is a problem for the king when he learns that his wife is one of them, right? Uh, Because I don't, I'm not really sure that up until this point, he's figured that out. Haman has done some kind of backdoor conniving uh, to get this decree signed by the king and sent out by the king that on this certain day of this certain month, this time, everyone in the kingdom is allowed to do violence to the Jews, to this certain people, uh, and, and it'll be a good thing. And the king promotes this and says this is what should happen. Uh, and uh, word has gone out and gotten out that this is coming. So Mordecai has entreated with Esther to say, hey, you have the ear of the king. He actually likes you. Maybe you should use that and speak on behalf of our people. And maybe even, this is where we get the line, for such a time as this, God has placed you where you are. Right? A hat tip to God's, I'm going to use a couple of big terms here that are scary, uh, predestination and foreknowledge which are not generally things we should try to investigate or figure out on our own unless the clear word of God has revealed it to us, Hmm. which for the most part he doesn't. Right. (laughs) Uh, That becomes a dangerous road, folks, Uh, dear listeners, when you start trying to figure out uh, or explain why God has done what God has done, and then you think you have it figured out because unless God has told you why, got to remember God is always doing more than one thing at a time. Always doing more than one thing at a time. So the best thing we can do is say, okay, but what has he promised and what has he done for us in Christ? So here, at the end of chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7, Esther throws another feast. She threw one and said, King, I have a request, but she didn't really follow through on making the request during the first feast. She just wined and dined the king and his pals. Now she's thrown another feast and Haman is invited, and the king is invited, and Esther made sure that both these men are invited. Uh, So now they come to the feast, and um, the wine drinking begins. Haman is ushered in. The queen is having this feast, and this is where we come to our text for today. There's there's one there's one detail I think that is is worth picking up from chapter six as well that in in between the first feast and now this second feast, 
Haman has been forced to honor Mordecai. In the previous chapter, Haman thought that he was about to receive the king's honor, and so he told the king exactly how he wanted to be honored personally, but much to Haman's surprise, that honor was to be bestowed upon Mordecai, and the king put it upon Haman to actually bestow that honor upon Mordecai. So yeah. Haman has very recently been humiliated, and it's now right on the heels of that, and even his own family has realized, hey, you're in trouble, buddy. This isn't going to go well for you. Yeah. It's yeah, right on the heels wife of that. Says, that yeah, it's Haman's, own wife. it's Haman's own wife who says to him, yeah, you're going to fall, <laughs> right? Uh, it's, in, it's right there at verse 13. And Haman told his wife and all his friends everything that had happened. And then his wise men and his wife said to him, If Mordecai, before, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but you will surely fall before him. I mean, they, they just, the writing's on the wall. We all know where this is going now. Haman's advisors, Haman's own wife, has made the statement to Haman, you're toast. Absolutely toast. There's there's no way around it at this point. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that's it's right. it, and it and I mean the effect of this will be it's not just Haman. I, I mean Haman might lose his position. Maybe more. We'll find out. Haman's advisors, Haman's household, Haman's wife. If Haman is shamed publicly Mm. not just in his own heart, then they're all going to be affected too. And this is where, so in, in this chapter, then what happens, what has happened already privately, Haman has left after he has was forced to honor Mordecai. He has left that in disgrace, and it's been a basically a private disgrace that, as you mentioned, he does reveal to his own wife and to his private advisors. But now that private disgrace is going to be made public, here in this chapter, we kind of where this is headed. It's really interesting as you as we read through the book of Esther, how again what seems to be just from a surface reading, coincidence, chance, or luck is in fact God at work in His providence. All of those pieces really have been put into place by the time we get to our text, and now what we get to see from here on forward is how the Lord works out all of those things that. You know, even Mordecai admitted, who knows whether it was for such a time as this? He doesn't know himself, but what we're going to start to see here going forward is how the Lord, having put these pieces into place, now causes all the things to happen that he was working toward when we were scratching our heads wondering what's going on. I think starting in this chapter, that's where we really get to see what's going on. We're going to see how the Lord works out that deliverance and how those pieces which he put into place now all come to bear in just the way that he desired it all along. Right. While worth noting, as we get into our text, the first three words, while they were yet talking. Hmm. Right. So as we come to our reading, Haman and his wise men and his wife, they're all in conversation about Haman's injured pride, and they all know his secret plan, and they're all aware that, Haman, if your secret plan is involving Mordecai, then... All right. Yeah, it's one of these. There you go. That's good. That's right. So we have that lead up. We're picking up again right where we left off at the in chapter 6, verse 13, chapter 6, verse 14 is the beginning of our text today. Into chapter 7, we turn now to the text. While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. So the king and Haman went into the feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted for my wish, and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. 
if we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine, as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, fifty cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. That's our text for today, Esther chapter 6, verse 14 through chapter 7, verse 10. Pastor Shockman, as you noted, our text begins right as the other one is ending. While they were still talking, here come the king's eunuchs to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. Just again, thinking back how the narrative has progressed up to this point, at the end of chapter 5, Haman was on cloud 9 for having gotten invited to the feast that Esther was going to. It was only Haman and the king that were invited to this feast, and he was on cloud 9, have to wonder what's going through his mind at this point as he's going to the second feast with everything that's happened now. And I mean, apparently he forgot about the feast because it, I mean, right there in verse 14 and hurried to bring Haman to the feast, right? So it's not like Haman was just almost ready to leave and then was going to get there like a minute late. He wasn't planning on moving anywhere. He was busy talking with his wife and his wise men about the predicament that he was in. Because now he's in a predicament because he had to publicly, publicly praise Mordecai. By the way, just a reminder, because the irony of what falls out in this chapter is pretty wonderful. Why is it that Haman hated Mordecai so much? Listeners, do you remember this part of the story, right? This is why Haman is so against Mordecai. It's because Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman. Right, So as this unfolds, that's going to come up. So Haman, who apparently forgot that he was invited to this feast, that at one point he was very proud of having been invited to. Pride goes before the fall. We should remember that one. That's right. He gets ushered into the queen's presence, into the king's presence. Let, and, let's, yeah. Can we pause there? That yeah. pride goes before the fall. Because we've talked a little bit about this previously with Haman and the way that his pride blinds him. And I think that really, I don't know that I noticed it until you were talking about it just now, but that has continued even up to this moment. So his pride blinded him in the previous chapter when he was thinking, certainly the king must want to honor me. There's no one else that the king would want to bestow honor upon. And so his pride blinds him into, again, giving the king, here's the way you honor the guy you like, and then he's forced to do all that for Mordecai. Right. So now his pride has continued to blind him, but just in a, a different way. As he has, I know, moping is probably not strong enough a term, but as he's been moping over what's gone on with Mordecai, that pride has continued to blind him such that he's about to miss this feast that he was really excited to go to, his pride has once again blinded him to about to miss a good thing that would have been for him. I just it, it struck me again. So maybe talk a little bit more about the blinding nature of pride. Pride goes before the fall that we're seeing from Haman here. Well, yeah, and, and to note, then as he is hurried into this feast, what, what kind of misgivings do you think he's got? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, Haman was all set... To, to not go, or he just forgot. I think more that he was willing to not go, which might have had some repercussions too. Maybe not as significant as the ones that actually befall him. Uh, so that that idea, though, that you mentioned that pride blinds you, uh, I think in the same way that, that anger can blind you, in the same way that hatred can blind you. In fact, I would go so far as to say 
there are times when our emotions, whatever they may be, can blind us to the reality of a situation. Now, that's not to say emotions are bad. They're gifts that God has given us. We just have to keep them in the proper place, right? And use them as the gifts that God has given us, which is true of any of the gifts that God has given us, right? When we don't use them properly or when we give them too much authority with any of the gifts that God gives us. Obviously, as an example, if you give alcohol too high of a place in your life and priorities, there are repercussions, Yeah. right? Okay, but the same can be true of our emotions, especially the fiery ones, right? Or the self-serving ones, whether that be anger or pride or jealousy, they blind us to what's going on around us. We tend to operate in very myopic ways when we're operating out of our emotions. Haman thinks very highly of himself, always has. And in thinking of very highly of himself, he assumes that other people think very highly of him too. And why not? (laughs) Seems like a great guy too. Doesn't he? I want to hang out with him. Not at all. Mordecai I'd sit down and have a beer with. This guy, not so much. He comes then... Well, ushered uh, ushered by a, the eunuchs into the feast. Hang on. I'm getting fine. to your question, right? The, what, I didn't well, know I'd asked a question. You t- asked me to talk about the whole pride goes before the fall thing. That's right. Okay. So when he comes into the feast, ushered now by the eunuchs, even in his own, he's still in pride of himself, which causes him to be untrusting or have misgivings about why he is being ushered now into this feast. It's not like he was invited and he gets to come with some pomp. He's being hurried into the feast. That's not exactly how an honored guest comes in. But does he see it that way? We don't really know. The text doesn't really say. Because it's not until the second day of the feast. Uh, The second day, right? (laughs) He's come and he's been a part of the feast. They've been they've been drinking wine and feasting for a whole day. Now it's the second day of the feast. And the king says to his bride, yet again, what do you want? It'll be yours. Up to the half of the kingdom, what do you want? Right. Um, and then she uses the same language that the decree that Haman had the king write uses. Which has got to be, the, the irony of that has got to be, like, apparent to Haman. It's his own words coming back to haunt him, right? So she lays out her request, and her request is simple. Don't kill me. Don't kill my people. Because we've been sold, not sold into slavery, again, not sold to another nation. We have been given over to death, to destruction, the Hebrew actually makes that a point that is this is not sold for profit. This is sold into into devastation. To be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. And she even prefaces this. Now look, King, if it was just that you were selling my people to another nation, I wouldn't have said anything. In part because I'd be fine. But I what mean, you I- But what you're going to lose, King, what you're going to lose when you kill all my people is me. King doesn't need any further explanation here, does he? Let's, before we go too much farther, let's go back, if I can, just a moment to to Haman's pride. Mm. And this really is maybe more of an overarching comment with the the narrative as a whole in this chapter. But I I think it's, it's worth just a moment reflection again, since we're talking about his pride. So contrast the way Haman's pride and arrogance up to this moment has given him what seems to be success, in particular chapter 3. His pride, his arrogance, his quick work in that regard has given him what seems to be this wonderful opportunity to get precisely what he wants, 
and it seems thus far, maybe up until the last chapter, that the wicked prosper. This question that the Psalms often ponder, why is it that the wicked prosper? And it has seemed up to this point, at least from a surface reading, in many respects, that Haman is precisely that. But what this chapter really gives us in the turn, then, is that actually the wicked don't prosper, and it is the patient, godly behavior and actions of Esther and Mordecai that the Lord is going to vindicate. So that, again, pride, arrogance, those emotions that could be put into a... The way I like to talk about emotions is they have a ministerial use, a service under God's Word, which Haman has let them run amok and run with them in in ungodly ways. The patience, the trust in the Lord that Mordecai and Esther have exhibited up to this far is actually going to be vindicated at this moment, and the pride and arrogance of Haman, which looked like it was going to get you what you wanted, in fact is going to fail. And along with that pride and arrogance is that Haman has never been forthright Hmm. in what he's actually planning to do, not with the king, right? He may have laid out the whole plan to some others, but with the guy that's really in charge, he never gives the whole story. He doesn't relay out the whole plan or the reason why he wants this plan to be the plan. He's he's concealed and conspired and conscripted now the Jews into destruction. So the comparison I'd rather make is look at how underhandedly Haman operates Hmm. and how in the full light of day, in in, in truth, in humble honesty, Esther operates. And she doesn't think too highly of herself, even when Mordecai learns of the plot back in chapter 2 and tells her, this is what's coming. She's she's not so sure. Right? Mm -hmm. And Mordecai schemes and works behind the scenes. But God has a way, God has a way, folks, of seeing behind the scenes, even when we think no one's watching. And it is his truth that will win out eventually. And and what we in our sinfulness may want to simply get rid of and destroy so that we don't have to deal with it because it frustrates us. Uh, I I like that contrast between the way that Haman has worked in the shadows, whereas now Esther is coming into the light, and how as the light exposes what's really going on, again, we see how the Lord wins the day, how he's known all along what's been going on, and none of this has been hidden from his sight, and now that it's all coming into the light, the Lord is making right what otherwise wickedness sought to make wrong, and and to do so in the shadows, and now Esther simply brings it into the light, with a a humble plea before the king for her own life and for her own people, and in, again, a very humble way to express, here, dear king, you are going to lose far greater if you allow this to happen. She has done so in a humble, simple way, bringing to light what has been hidden, allowing the, the truth now to win. And again, although the Lord has been unnamed throughout the book of Esther and continues so in this chapter, he very clearly is the one who is leading and guiding events for the sake of delivering his people. So let's pick up more of those thoughts on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Jason Shockman this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Who does Lutheran Church Extension Fund serve, you ask? It's simple. We serve Lutheran Church Missouri Synod ministries and church workers with loans and ministry services. And it's faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, investing with LCEF that makes it possible for LCEF to serve these ministries. Learn more at lcef.org. 
LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Friday, June 28th. We're studying Esther chapter 6, verse 14 through chapter 7, verse 10 with Pastor Jason Schockman. He serves at St. Paul's Lutheran Church School and Early Childhood Center in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. Pastor Schockman, prior to the break, we were talking about the humility of Esther as she comes before the Queen now with her request here during this second feast, on the second day of that feast, in fact. And in her request, as she echoes language from Haman's decree, as you mentioned, when she actually speaks what she asks, she asks for not only for her own life, but also for the life of her people. And this is, I think, a significant moment in the book of Esther. Up to this point, Mordecai, remember, had told Esther, don't reveal your background just yet. Now that time has come. And the fact that Esther now is willing to be identified with the people of God, willing to suffer with the people of God, because it's not a, although maybe as the readers of this text, we think we know where it's going, it's not a given for Esther at this moment that the king is in fact going to do what she wants, that he will spare her people. That's still unknown. When she comes out, please spare me and my people, she's willing to be identified as a member of God's people and suffer along with them. That seems like a pretty significant moment in the book undeniably and not only is she identifying herself with this people of god the judahites those of the tribe of judah right one of the 12 tribes that's been taken captive in 20 years or so they'll come back with ezra and nehemiah and rebuild the city but for now not only has the decree already gone out from the king as written by haman that all of them should be killed but she's now willing to place herself in the line of fire. She's not revealed it previously, and now she has, and it's for the sake of her people. You and I were talking off air about Moses, right? Not considering leaving himself in the wealth of Egypt, like in the place of power and and authority in Egypt, as valuable as leading his people out. Hmm. Uh, and and by faith, looking forward to a greater city, a city not built by hands, right? Esther, who as the queen <laughs> of a pretty powerful nation, yeah. who who has pretty much everything one could want in an earthly life, is will in the same way by faith willing to place herself in line with in the, in the line of the attack with the people of God because she doesn't know how he's going to react. She doesn't know if he's going to fall on Haman's side or if she's going to listen to him or to her. And she makes the request. Uh, ironically, she uses the same language that Haman's decree uses. The irony just keeps getting sweeter, folks, by the way. And he hears the request and the king immediately wants to know, who is it? Who made this happen? Who has dared to do this? That that phrase, by the way, is worth noting. The, the, the ESV translated, and I forgot to mention this to you before we started, but this one I think is worth noting. The ESV translates this as who, verse 5, right? The king says, who is he and where is he? Who has dared to do this? The Hebrew is whose heart has filled him to do this because the king recognizes that this is evil. Mm. This the thing that you're telling me you and your people have been consigned to. This isn't just a scheme. This is evil. And this evil is what comes from the human heart. So whose heart has filled him to do this? Mm. You can almost you can, in Esther's response, she immediately answers the question, by the way, and you can almost hear like this breathless relief of excitement that by the king's answer, she's got it that he's with her. 
Mm-hmm. So who am I? Basically, the king says, okay, queen, who am I taking out? Somebody plan to do this evil harm to you? Oh, I got an answer for that. So who's going to die? <laughs> I, so with the king here, and I, and I do appreciate the way the Hebrew is worded and the, the insight that gives us into the, the wickedness of the human heart, even with the way we were talking about Haman's pride and arrogance, I think the image of your heart being, you're full of yourself, that's an expression we have in English still. Maybe there's something there as well. But I, I am curious on your thoughts about the king here with this Like, he's the one that gave Haman the ring in the first place to make the decree. Like, has the king forgotten his role in all this, or was he just not paying attention when Haman asked him the question? Was Haman really that that underhanded that the king didn't realize what's going on? I'm not—I guess I wonder if—I don't think Ahasuerus comes off in the best light. I mean, yeah, he sounds like a dinosaur, right? That's right. So I think there's two things going on here. I think, one, Haman—Haman is exceedingly good— at being, at conspiring. Haman is exceedingly good at bringing the king along with all of the kingly authority to just do what Haman wants him to do. Which is why, by the way, back in chapter 6, Haman just assumes the king is going to honor him. Because he, he pretty well has the king bamboozled in every other way. Why wouldn't he just think I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread? Whoops. Oh, careful. I, I think there's a little bit of Haman is just exceedingly good at manipulation. And I think there's also a little bit of the ki- the king openly has trusted Haman. And in some ways, Haman has earned that. He's done some things that have served the king very well. We can only assume. And he's a king. Uh, he doesn't think anybody would do something that would be against what he would want. Because he's full of himself because he's a king. Sure. Yeah, and a Babylonian king at that. I mean, so now here in this moment, uh, who is it? Where is he? Whose heart is so wicked? Uh, yeah. and, and Esther's response is, it's a foe and an enemy. Now, hang on. <laughs> why is she clarifying it first? By Why doesn't she just give him a name? Why doesn't she just say, it's Haman, O king? I don't know. Yeah. She is qualifying the enemy and, and the vicious adversary of her people. Hmm. La- she's labeling him. She's speaking the truth of the evil that's in his heart. This isn't just he's been working for his own good. He is out to do evil. And it can't stand. And that evil has been done by Haman. Haman. And then Haman, terrified, is sitting there when the king gets up in his wrath, in his wrath from the wine drinking. So he's back to your question about how does this happen under the king's watch? King's had a few. Which probably makes his anger all the hotter, right? Yeah. So he gets up now, and and yet the king gets up and he goes out for a walk, right? He goes to cool his head. He takes off into the garden. Now, Haman stayed behind. Why? To beg for, for his life from the queen. He's heard the king. The king got up and stormed out. The only thing he can think the king is bringing is wrath. Who is he going to go to for mercy? He's going to go to Esther. Did Haman know Esther was a Jew from the tribe of Judah? Was Haman well aware of this? I don't know. Might have snuck up yeah, on. I don't. Might have snuck up on him too. I think it. I think it did. I, there, I was. I was pondering that myself as to whether, like, how much Haman does or doesn't know about Esther, and and it's also possible, I suppose, that up until he got invited to Esther's feast back in chapter five, that he hadn't really paid her much much attention at all. He has been so focused on Mordecai, though, that, and knowing Mordecai's ongoing interactions with Esther, even when happening through messengers, you, you wonder how much Haman had put together. I don't know that the the text makes it explicit anywhere, but at this moment, it would, I think, be assumed, and it's pretty clear that he does realize who yeah. she is at this point. Yeah. But now, 
she's not someone that he's got any power over. No. Rather, he, she's one that he must beg for. I mean, so you see the utter reversal. Yeah, and here's the irony. falling right? before her. Like I yeah. said, the irony just keeps getting better. Because now the one thing that Mordecai wouldn't do that Haman got so upset about is the very thing that Haman does before Esther. Yeah. He bows himself down before her. <laughs> As the king walks back into the palace, he sees Haman bowing down before her. And this is this will tell you something about the king's state of mind. He obviously puts the best construction on this. Obviously, Haman's just begging for his life. Oh, no. He assumes Haman's out to do harm to my wife right now. And to his credit, unlike Adam, the king actually says, no, hmm. you're not going to harm her. That's not going to fly. What's going to happen? In my own house, you're going to go after my wife? Not going to happen. So one of the king's eunuchs who's in attendance says, hey, not only that, but uh, Haman has prepared for Mordecai a steak. Before you get there, maybe it's worth, before you get, because the steak yeah. is coming. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But at the end of verse 8, after Ahasuerus says, is he going to, are you even going to do this in my own house? As that word is leaving his lips, they cover Haman's face. That detail, yeah. the covering of Haman's face, also, I think, plays into his humiliation here. It might be worth a moment reflection, because that's what he did to himself in the why, last chapter. Why are they covering his face? What's that mean? Good question. That's why I asked you. Oh, thanks. Uh Essentially, they put a bag over his head. Yeah. Uh, I mean, l literally, they covered his face. They put a bag over his head because they're going to kill him. He's going to die. So, so they, as, he's, as the king is speaking, Haman is taken captive, cuffed and bound, and bag over his head. And you, you think like the, when like, somebody gets snatched, and like the spy movies and whatnot, right? A van pulls up by the side of the road, and all of a sudden, three people jump out, and two people grab the person, one puts a bag over their head, and they throw them in the van. That, that's right. the picture you get here. Haman's face gets covered. He gets taken, and as they're doing this, one of the eunuchs says, oh, by the way, or behold, there's a steak that Haman yeah. has prepared for Mordecai. The ESV translates it as gallows. The word is tree. It, stake. It, it is what they're going to hang him on. Now, whether that means they're going to hang him like by a noose or hang him like nail him to it, you know, the one who gets hung on a tree is cursed. There's an interesting little thing we could use there. I points think so. To, Hold on. To somebody I imagine else. you might dwell on that for a moment, but before before we do, just that the, the thought of the way that this all befalls Haman it's almost like every single domino falls right after the other really quickly here. Yeah, and yeah. especially even to the point where as the word of execution has left the king's mouth, they're throwing the bag over his head for that very execution. It just, it, again, our conversation earlier about how Haman has been plotting in the dark, and he's been doing that for quite some time. There was that casting of lots that took place over an extended period of time, Haman patiently plotted in the darkness for just the right moment to do all that he was prepared to do in his evil. And then as soon as the light shines on it, it all comes undone. Which, I mean, again, I think there's it, something to that it doesn't that, just that we come would be, do well to learn. But it doesn't just come undone. It comes to rest on him. Yeah. It's not just that it all falls apart. Because it doesn't actually fall apart. It actually all happens to him. Mm. It's, it's one of those... Like, Talk more about that. Yeah. It's one of those applications of that proverbial wisdom of be careful what you wish for, you just might get it. Mm. Right? Mm. Us uh, who are by nature sinful and unclean, yet redeemed by Christ the crucified, it's often good to remember what, getting what you really deserve and seeing in our own nature our inner Haman, that, that we would be led to repentance, not to point at Haman and say, ah, what a, such an evil dude serves you right, because we're a little Haman too, right? And that's where I think, I mean, Haman, as an example in the Scriptures, a negative example to be sure, Absolutely. but still an example, is a very powerful one, particularly as he meets his end right here in chapter 7, mm -hmm. that it all comes back on him, the, the Lutheran Study Bible, in, in one of its notes, uh, comments that, that this is a good example of, of Proverbs 26, verse 27, whoever digs a pit 
will fall into it, and a stone will come back on him who starts it rolling. And, and certainly you see that happen to Haman as he is now impaled on his own stake that he had prepared for, for Mordecai. But as you said, this isn't for us to sit and just gloat at what happened to Haman, but rather is an example so that we would look at our own lives and, as St. Paul says, take heed lest we fall. Yeah. This is an opportunity for us to, to consider, where am I plotting evil against a neighbor? Where am I spending my time trying to just arrange all the pieces just right so that I get what I want in my pride, arrogance, and I get it at the expense of my neighbor? Or even just the to example consider, of him, or, even, or even just to consider, where am I building idols? Sure. Where am I building my own idols and trusting in my own wisdom instead of relying on the wisdom of God? Instead of trusting what God has clearly revealed, where am I setting up my own plans and then asking God to bless them? Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, it doesn't... It, because so often we don't consider that we're plotting evil. Uh, and, and we may not be, right? We may be plotting good or trying to bring good about for us or for others, but good by whose standard and good by whose definition. And all too often that's our own and not the Lord's. So there's a bit of a challenge here for us as sure. the people of God to s- see ourselves in the characters of Scripture and to see where God has promised justice but justification also okay so let's 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 go from there then again that that the moment where we you know we are going to reflect upon our own lives to see where our plotting our planning in the darkness whether against a neighbor or setting up an idol might lead us to fall into the very pit that we're digging for someone else that's an opportunity for repentance yeah you want to make a connection also then, so not only the justice that we deserve, but let's talk about the justification yeah. that God gives. And through the connection with what's going on here with the gallows, the tree... The stake. You've got about eight minutes yeah. to think through this a little bit. One, only, and I'll say only one of the commentaries that I stumbled across on this refers to this as Haman's cross, which I immediately went, oh, that's gold. It's not a one-to-one correlation, folks. We can't really see Haman as Jesus, except cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. And God then made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Right. So here is Christ on the cross, and, and this is, if you've got, uh, I'm looking at one right now. So if you've got a crucifix with a corpus on it, This is where we look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He who knew no sin became sin. He became Haman. He took all the guilt, all the shame, all the arrogance and pride, and all that gets crushed in the justice of a holy God on himself, as he hung on a tree and even cried, my God, why have you forsaken me? That we, you and I, baptized into his death and resurrection, might not be Haman and be hung on a tree, but rather be joined with him who is risen victoriously from the dead to promise us justification and life in him uh, it's easy when we fall to think, boy, if I just try harder or if I stay on the path more, I, I'll, I'll just get back to it and I'll get back to being a better Christian, better husband, better father, better student, better whatever. We try to make ourselves better. That that was the problem that Adam had in the, in the garden too. Eve had it too, right? Look what God has forbidden and see it as good, pleasing, and desirable. Don't do that. Uh, instead, uh, when we fall, when we find ourselves in despair, when we find ourselves at the bottom of the pit that we've dug for ourselves and our own attempts to make life whatever we thought it should be instead of what God has given us, then we are simply called to look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for that joy that was set before him, the joy of 
you, of claiming you as a part of his salvation. That joy uh, endured the cross so that we can say, Lord, lift me up. And, and when I fall, when I stray, you, Lord, are the one who can restore me. You are the one who declares me righteous, who speaks the word of justification over me because uh, I can't do it myself. So, yep, mm. put the bag over the head of my old Adam, drown him in the waters of my baptism daily, and watch as God is at work in his word of promise to restore you. How's that? I, I think the... Sorry, go ahead. How'd I do on time? <laughs> no, no, you're, we still got a, few, a couple minutes to reflect on that. Oh. And just as, I mean... No, and that's okay. You're, you're fine. You're fine. Because there's a few things I think that, that are helpful to think about when we consider at Haman's cross. What we're not saying is that somehow Haman is a type of Christ in that he dies on behalf of someone or something like yeah, that. Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> so this is what I think is helpful though about this is that when you think about this as Haman's cross, where we've what we've seen from Haman thus far is that at this moment in Esther, what seven verse ten. Haman gets exactly what he deserves. That is, I mean, you talk about a fitting end to that satisfies. Like, that's the bad guy getting what he earned right there. And if there ever was a cursed man to be hung on a tree, Haman is that guy. So I think, I mean, calling it Haman's cross allows us to see in a very stark and severe way the reality of what the cross is. This is not a pretty thing. This is the place where the worst, the cursed criminals go. Like the two That's hung Jesus with Jesus. Went. Yeah. Who, and but see, who and then when you see like okay, rightly. Go ahead. Who were being yeah. punished rightly, right? Reviling Jesus until one of them goes, Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> well, you're being punished justly. He's innocent. Wait, which makes Haman's cross not a one to Jesus cross, but it is a one to one for our own sinful nature. Right. So then, and this is the the place where I think that it's very helpful is because when we realize, yeah, that's where Haman deserved to go. It's where the two on either side of Jesus deserved to go, but it's not where Jesus deserved to go. Yet he went there willingly for me. Yeah, became and, and because it is yeah. where we deserve to go. Of I, our own, I think it, it is where we deserve to go. <laughs> So I think, and this is just the the point that I think we can really emphasize here, is that seeing it as Haman's cross helps us to appreciate all the more to give thanks to God for what our Lord Jesus has done, that he was willing to go there for my sakes. I think sometimes we forget that shame of the cross, and seeing Haman being hung on a cross and deserving it makes us, I think, appreciate all the more what our Lord Jesus has done, going to the place that he didn't deserve for our sakes, for us men, and for our salvation, this is what our Lord Jesus has done. Wrap it up with about two minutes, Pastor Shockman. I'm going to go back to the same verse that I've been at before. Right? God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That's what Jesus is doing on the cross. He is not just bearing your sin. He is your sin on the cross. We can look at that cross of Christ see Jesus on it, bearing our sin, being our sin, taking the punishment of our sin, and know there is redemption for us in him, right? This is what part of what makes Romans 6, that we are baptized into his death. Such a glorious thing. Mm. Uh, because there, we might sing, alas, and did my Savior bleed. There's all kinds of hymnity running through my head at the moment, right? Sure. <laughs> that takes us to this cross. There's all kinds of songs that we sing through the Lenten season and through the rest of the church year for that matter that that draw us to this sacrifice, to this accepting the cup that the Father had given him and he drank it to the dregs for you and for me. There is such wonder in that Folks, there's such joy in that, in, in knowing when we come face to face with the reality of our own sin, that we can simply confess it. And God, who is faithful and just, that is, he's faithful, he, mu- he must punish sin, he's a holy God, he's just, 
He can't just sweep it under the rug and pretend it doesn't exist. He didn't. He poured it out all on his son. He who is faithful and just forgives our sins. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness, not just some, but all. And that goes not just for the guilt of our sin, but for the shame that we bear because others have sinned against us. Like Haman has sinned against Esther and Mordecai. Even that shame is covered over in the righteousness of Christ. Thanks be to God. Pastor Jason Schockman is, he serves at St. Paul's Lutheran Church School and Early Childhood Center in Oconomowoc, Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. He's been helping us today to study Esther chapter 6, verse 14, through chapter 7, verse 10. Pastor Schockman, thanks for being our guest today. Glad to be here. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Esther chapter 7, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Join us on Monday as we jump into Esther chapter 8 to see how King Ahasuerus, Esther, and Mordecai deal with the aftermath of Haman's death. Thanks for spending the morning with us today. Talk to you again next week. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.